all glorious the assembled devotees. All glorious the assembled devotees. All glorious the assembled devotees. All glorious to Sri Sri Guru and Gurunga. All glorious to Srila Prabhupada. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. So reading from the Srimad Bhagavatam, first canto, 17th chapter, text 40 and 41, actually. I'm going to do 40 myself because it's a, basically just um, about the same thing Judah Karma covered very nicely yesterday in his class. So I'll chant the Sanskrit and read the translation in the short purport, and then we'll do 41 together. Okay? Amuni Panchastanani hi adharma prabhavakali. Well, didn't get it. I'm going to do this one on my own, and I'm going to do. Yeah, I know. I'm going to. I'm going to. Well, I'm going to chant it myself, and then we'll go 41 together. Amuni Panchastanani hi adharma. I'll, I'll do this one myself, and then we'll do the next one together. Okay. Amuni Panchastanani hi adharma prabhavakali. O Tadeyena Datani Yavasatani Deshakrit. Translation Thus, the personality of Kali, by the directions of Maharaj Prikit, the son of Uttara, was allowed to live in those five places. Purport. Thus, the age of Kali began with gold stand standardization, standardization, and therefore falsity, intoxication, animal slaughter, and prostitution are rampant all over the world and the saner section is eager to dr drive out corruption. The counteracting process is suggested above and everyone can take advantage of this suggestion. So that counteracting process, Prabhupada said, was that instead of paper currency, actual gold coins should be used for exchange and this will stop prostitution of gold. So, okay, so now we're gonna do 41 together. A Titani na Seveta. A Titani na Seveta. Bubu shu pudu shak vachit. Bubu shu pudu shak vachit. Vishesh vato dharmo shilo. Vasheshato Dharma Shilo Raja Loka Patir Guru Raja Loka Patir Guru A Titani Naseveta Bubushu Purushak Vachit Visheshato Dhamma Shilo Raja Loka Patir Guru Taitani Naseveta Bubushu Purushak Vachit
Vaishnavis. Ata, therefore, etani, all these, na, never, sevita, came in contact, come in contact, sorry, bubushu, those who desire well-being, purusha, person, kvachit, in any circumstances, Visheshataha, specifically, Dharma Shila, those who are on the progressive path of liberation, Raja, the king, Lokapati, public leader, Guru, the Brahmins and the sannyasis. Translation and purport by His Divine Grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami, Srila Prabhupada. Therefore, whoever desires progressive well-being, especially kings, religionists, public leaders, brahmanas, and sannyasis, should never come in contact with the four above-mentioned irreligious principles. Purport. The brahmins are the religious preceptors for all other castes, and the sannyasis are the spiritual masters for all the caste and orders of society. So also are the king and the public leaders who are responsible for, for the material welfare of the people. The progressive religionists and those who are responsible human beings or those who do not want to spoil their valuable human life should refrain from all the principles of irreligiosity, especially illicit connection with women. If a Brahmin is not truthful, all his claims as a Brahmin at once become null and void. If a sannyasi is illicitly connected with women, all his claims as a sannyasi at once become false. Similarly, if the king and the public leader are unnecessarily proud or habituated to drinking and smoking, certainly they become disqualified to discharge public welfare activities. Truthfulness is the basic principle for all religions. The four leaders of human society, namely the sannyasis, the brahmins, the king, and the public leader, must be tested crucially by their character and qualification. Before one can be accepted as a spiritual, mas spiritual or material master of society, he must be tested by the above-mentioned criteria of character. Such public leaders may be less qualified in academic qualifications, but it is necessary, but it is necessary primarily that they be free from the contamination of the four disqualifications, namely gambling, drinking, prostitution, animal slaughter. Omagana Tamadam Dasha Jananjana Shalakaya Chakshura Militam Yena Tasma Shri Gudavena Maha Shri Chaitana Manobishtam Stapitam Yena Bhutale Swayam Vipagara Mayam Dirati Swapanatikam. So this verse is talking about leadership and the qualifications and disqualifications of leadership. So leadership is important. In the third chapter of the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna says, Yad yadacharati shreistas tad tadaveta rojanas sayap pramanam kudute lokas tadanavartate that whatever a great man does, <clears throat> common men follow in their footsteps and whatever stand they, a standard they uh, set by exemplary acts, the whole world pursues. Now it's people follow leaders, basically. That's the idea. So whoever you have as your leaders, people are going to follow. If you have good leaders, you're going to have people doing good things and if you have bad leaders then people are going to follow that example too 
So it's very important. Especially in human society, it's really important to have good leadership because um, you know, human life is meant for making progress towards going back home, back to Godhead. And it is difficult. You know, it's, it's a challenge. It's a challenge. It's like, I remember one of the first classes I heard um, when I went to the temple in Brooklyn was the, the, whoever was giving the class made the point that in trying to become a, a devotee and go back to Godhead is like swimming upstream. And, you know, you have to really, you have to make an effort. Okay? Because the natural tendency of a conditioned soul is to want to enjoy the senses. You know, the natural tendency of a conditioned soul is you want to do these things. You want to engage in illicit sex, meeting, intoxication, and gambling. So to, to not do those things requires an effort. So people have to have, you know, good example of, uh, otherwise they're just going to think, well, look, the leaders, you know, the, these are the people who are supposed to be superior and they're not doing it. They're not controlling their senses. So why do I have to do it? And they're just going to, they give in, they cave in, and they just, they won't. So leadership is very important. As I said, people follow leaders. And um, so here is some of the, it's, it's pointing out that the, uh, if, if, if these personalities like Brahmins and sannyasis and Chatriyas, if they fail in the primary qualifications, you know, if, they, if they are not able to fulfill one of some of the primary characteristics of that role, then they're disqualified. Because, say, like, if, you know, if a Brahmin is not truthful, well, being truthful is one of the primary characteristics of a Brahmin. Samadhamma tapaso cham shanti arjavam. Sorry, arjavam, evacha. You know, that's one of the uh, primary characteristics of a Brahmin. So if a Brahmin's not truthful, if a sannyasi is not celibate, if a chatri is not uh, righteous, then they're really, you know, they're, they're failing. They're failing to execute their duty. It's like, that's, it's, it's a dharma. A dharma means, dharma means one's religious duty. So if, if these leaders fail on those primary characteristics, then it's a dharmic. It's like having salt that is stale or sugar that's not sweet or chili that's not hot. Useless, you see? They're useless in, in terms of leadership. They're just going to be misleaders. And, um, <clears throat> why, and it's specifically pointed out about these four activities because they give us an indication of the person's character. See, like, in other words, if, if, a, if a Brahmin is not truthful, well, you know, it could be understood that what's, what's going on there, you know, he's being influenced by lust. In other words, if these leaders fail in these primary duties for that status of life, then it's an indication of where their head's at, so to speak, and that they really can't be trusted. In the third chapter, the, well, Chanaka Pandit says that you can't trust a politician or a woman, but in essence, what he's saying is you can't trust a materialistic person. You know, because like, for instance, if a woman is a devotee, you can trust her. Or if a politician is a devotee, you can trust him. But really what he's saying there is you can't trust a materialistic person. Why? Because they can't control their senses. And somebody who can't control their senses, you can't, you can't be trusted. Or they, they're not qualified to be a leader, you know, to lead people towards. Because, you know, in order to, be, to, make, to go back to Godhead, you have to be engaged in pious activities in this life and in previous lives. In the seventh chapter of the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna says, Yesham tvantakatam papam jananam punyakarmanam te dvanva mohaniya mukta bhajante mam judavrataha that only persons who have acted piously in this life and in previous lives whose sinful activities are completely eradicated can engage in my devotional service, you know, with firm determination. So the idea is that, you know, that's the general process that you have to be engaged in pious activities in this life and in previous lives. Your sinful activities have, com have to be completely eradicated. You know, then you can engage in devotional service. So we need people at, at, in leadership positions who are going to inspire people to do that inspire people to engage in pious activities in this life and, and, you know, strive to have all their sinful activities completely eradicated. And if, if the leaders aren't showing a good example, then the people won't do that and the whole human society goes down, which is exactly what's happened. Human, current, you know, contemporary human society is a, a perfect example of that. We don't have enlightened leadership. We're actually, unfortunately, 
contemporary human society is being very badly misled by people who are very, very far from enlightened and spiritual values and quite the contrary are extremely, very deeply in illusion, very deeply and pathetically in illusion. And as a result, human society is kind of going downhill. Um, the nature, and Krishna, in the third chapter of the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna explains the nature of the problem. He's, you know, he's, he, Arjuna asked Krishna a question. Um, By what is one forced, what is one impelled to act sinfully, even unwillingly, as if engaged by force? That was Arjuna's question. And Krishna's answer, Kama Esha Krota Esha Rajaguna Samudhava Mahasano Mahatmama Vidyanam Yavarna, that it's lust. It's lust and lust only Arjun, and it's born of contact with the material mode of passion and turns into wrath, etc. But Krishna says it's the eternal enemy. So the idea is this that um, if somebody, from, from, it's kind of like reverse engineering. You can understand from somebody's behavior where their consciousness is at. So if somebody's engaging in these activities, illicit sex, meeting, intoxication, and gambling, then you can understand that they're being influenced by lust. The, and the nature of lust, and this is the problem, the nature of lust is that it, it impels one to act sinfully, even unwillingly, as if engaged by force. See? So in other words, and, and later on in that chapter, just a few verses down the road, Krishna says, Avritam jnanam etena, jnanino nitya vairina, kamanupena kunteya, duspadena analenicha that this lust, it covers the consciousness, it covers the wisdom of the living entity, it's never satisfied, and it burns like fire. You see? So if you've got somebody in a position of leadership who's being influenced by lust, you've got a problem. You've got a problem, because you have a person who's going to be impelled by force to act sinfully. Lust is never satisfied, it burns like fire. So the person won't be able to restrain themselves. You see, that's why Prabhupada says here in the prophet, before one can be accepted as a spiritual master, a spiritual or material master, he must be tested by the above mentioned criteria of character. Super important because if, you know, this, and this is like a preliminary test. If somebody can't do those things, refrain, restrain themselves from engaging in those four sinful activities, then, uh-uh, they, they, you know, they're not even close to being qualified to be a leader because they're going to succumb again. You know, they're impelled to act sinfully. Never, lust is never satisfied. It burns like fire. So you definitely can't have somebody like that in a, uh, a position of leadership. So, and Prabhupada makes the point here that, um, and, you know, and as devotees, we're, we're well aware of that. Like, for instance, if I, and it's sort of here in the last uh, couple sentences, Prabhupada says here, um, how such public leaders may be less qualified in academic qualifications, but it is necessary primarily that they be free from contamination of four disqualifications, namely gambling, drinking, prostitution, animal slaughter. So say we, would, to give everybody a choice here, you know, if, if you say you, you are looking for a spiritual master, okay, and you had the choice between two candidates, okay, one candidate was somebody who they knew by memory the entire Bhagavad Gita, Sanskrit and English, and they knew hundreds, hundreds of verses in the Srimad Bhagavatam, you know, very well versed, okay? But they were not engaging in devotional service. They just happened to be very, you know, scholarly like that. And they weren't following these regulative principles. That's one person. That was one candidate, you, you know, that you could choose as a spiritual master. The other candidate, um, fully engaged in devotional service, following all these regulative principles, doesn't know one verse by memory. Okay? So you have two, those two, two people to choose from. Who would you choose as your spiritual master? You have to choose, what? <laughs> you, chose, you choose the second one, you, uh, right? It's a no-brainer for a devotee. You wouldn't, you, know, you wouldn't even consider that first person because we know that purity is the force. And whereas that other person who's engaged in devotional service and, and um, is following the regulative principles, that's a person who could help you. That person could help you in your spiritual life, whereas that other person couldn't, would not be capable of it, would have, wouldn't have any potency, wouldn't have any spiritual potency at all. So, yeah, so that's the thing. So, as devotees, we're, we're well aware of this point, and um, it's our responsibility to not only be able to uh, 
identify, you know, we have to be able to discriminate and see who's qualified to follow and who's not. But even, and that's pretty easy for devotees. But more important than that, we have to work on ourselves. We have to become qualified to become leaders. We have to become qualified to be beyond um, the influence of lust in order to be, you know, lead people, you know, lead people in spiritual life. And uh, we've been given a program for doing that. Um, Rupa Goswami nicely kind of summarizes it in the first verse of the Nectar of Instruction, Upadesha Amrita. He says, Vacha Vegam, Manasakrota Vegam, Jiva Vegam, Udara Pashta Vegam, Etan Vegam, Yova Shaheta Dira, Sarvam Epimam Pativim Sasashat. That a person who uh, can control the urges of the tongue, belly, genitals, mind, words, and anger, he's He's qualified to make disciples all over the world. In other words, when you actually follow that program that Rupa Goswami outlines there, you become, what does it mean to become qualified? It doesn't mean you get a, you know, you get a certificate or something like that. You, get, you become empowered. You become empowered. Daivim prakutim ashrita. See, because those recommendations, those instructions Rupa Goswami made, it's, it's, it, it's controlling by engaging. See, our process for controlling the senses, our process for becoming, restraining ourselves from lust, anger, and greed is not like, you know, just holding on and like, ugh. No, it's not that. It's, it's not like forcefully restraining yourself. We engage. We engage the senses. Rishikena, how's it go? Sarva parivanemaktam tatpavartananimalam rishikena rishikena sevanam. We engage our senses in the service of the master of the senses. See? And by doing that, our senses become purified and they become connected with Krishna, you get a higher taste. And that's Panam Drishtra Navartate, you know, that verse Vishaya Vanivartante, Niha Harasha Dehina, Rasa Varjama Sopyasha, Panam Drishtra Navartate, that the embodied soul may be restricted from sense enjoyment, but the inclination, the taste for sense objects still remains, you still want to do it. So you can hold yourself back, but you still want to do it. But then Krishna says, but ceasing such engagements by experiencing a higher taste one becomes fixed in consciousness. So this is our program. Our program is engage the senses in the service of the master of the senses, Krishna, get a higher taste, and by doing that, then you become free. You know, then you're qualified then to sarvam uh, prativim, how's it going? Sarvam imam prativim Then you're qualified. Then you're, you become empowered to help people spiritually as a diksha guru, a shiksha guru, a vartma padarkshana guru, like that, all are equally important in one sense. You become empowered to do that by that process. So that's what we have to try to do. And um, we've been given, uh, you know, to get even more specific and practical about the whole thing, how do you do those things? Well, it's very, you know, exactly what Prabhupada has given us. Exactly what Prabhupada has given us. What we're doing here as Hare Krishna devotees every day is exactly following that instruction of Rupa Goswami of you know, controlling the tongue, belly, genitals, mind. We're, we're getting up early in the morning, rising by four o'clock, coming to the temple, chanting Hare Krishna, here in the Srimad Bhagavatam class, you know, get, engaging in service all day long, only eating prasadam, food first off at the Krishna, love and devotion, uh, going out and preaching. This is exactly fulfilling all the uh, executing, the you know, recommendations of Rupa Goswami there. And we always have to remind ourselves of, you know, the importance of these activities. Like, for instance, here, here we are hearing Srimad Bhagavatam. Okay, are we, why are we hearing Srimad Bhagavatam? Are we hearing Srimad Bhagavatam to, you know, become educated, to get it? Well, we are in a sense. I mean, to learn a lot of information, that's yeah, part of it. It's part of it, but it's far more than that. Hearing Srimad Bhagavatam, coming to Bhagavatam class, reading Prabhupada's books, is meant to do far more than just give us a lot of information. That's there. We get a lot of valuable information by reading Prabhupada's books, but you get much more. A big part of uh, why we're here to hear the Srimad Bhagavatam on a regular daily basis and why we recommend it to read Srila Prabhupada's books it is, is because this is transcendental sound vibration. It purifies our consciousness. Nasta prayeshu abhadireshu nityam bhagavata sevaya bhagavata uttama shloka bhakti bhavati nashtaki. 
by hearing the Bhagavatam, your consciousness becomes purified. It's, I mean, you learn stuff. You learn also, like Judicom pointed out yesterday from Prabhupada's purports, we learn about economics, we learn about philosophy, we learn about this, we learn, yeah, sure, that's true. But most important is you get your consciousness purified. That's what we're after. We want to purify the consciousness so that this love for Krishna, which is dormant within the heart of every living entity, becomes awakened. You see? And that's part of the process for doing that is regularly hearing the Srimad Bhagavatam. See? Um, these books are super important. Our conviction is that this is not, it's not ordinary mundane knowledge. And um, that, that comes from Prabhupada himself. It, it comes from the statements of the Bhagavatam, but he, uh, there's anecdotes that support that. Prabhupada was asked on various occasions, at least three that I can think of. There's three different devotees. When you watch the Prabhupada memories, there's three di different devotees that describe this same thing. I'm about the same, tell the same story I'm about to tell. Shruti Kirti, uh, formerly Bhagavat, I don't know what his name is now. And there was one other who, who I can't remember. But I remember seeing it from, hearing this from three different devotees on those memories. They go to visit, they go to see Prabhupada. He's in his room. And they see Prabhupada reading his own book. They see him reading the Krishna book. Or they see him reading the Srimad Bhagavatam. And they inquire, Prabhupada, how is it that you're reading your own book? And this is, I'm just going to paraphrase. This is not, you know, verbatim. Just, the gist of it was Prabhupada said, hey, I didn't write this book. You know, I, don't, I didn't write these books. When I sit down to write these books, Krishna comes and he in, inspires me. I mean, I think he, on one occasion he said, Krishna dictates and I, I just write. So, in those, so Prabhupada's uh, vision was, or his, 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 his understanding was, sh why shouldn't I read these books? These books are written by Krishna. I was just the instrument. Krishna just spoke through me and I'm reading, what, I'm reading Krishna's book, not my book. I just happen to be the, you know, the dic you know, the dict whatever, the, the machine that took, took the information and put it down. So Prabhupada himself read his books, and that was the explanation he gave for why he's read his books. So we should always remember that. That, you know, when we're hearing, uh, reading these books, that they, they, they were produced by a supernatural process, actually. You know, sure, Prabhupada was brilliant. He was a genius. And when he sat, you know, but on top of that, he was being empowered by Krishna. You know, he was Krishna's instrument. You know, he was like the iron rod in the hand of the, you know, man, like that. So, yeah, it's good to remember that, remind ourselves of that, that when you're reading, hearing the Srimad Bhagavatam, when you're reading the Srimad Bhagavatam, you're coming in contact with Krishna. And there's so many there's verses to support that, and it's purifying the consciousness. Similarly with the Hare Krishna mantra, same thing. Oh, well, before I go on to that point. And that's why, we, that's why Prabhupada emphasized book distribution so much because it's just the best way to give somebody a, an opportunity when you know when we go on Harinam and we chant people hear the holy name and that's good and they're hearing Krishna the holy name is non different from Krishna and they get benefit from that but if you're able to somehow if they're able to somehow to get a book into the hands and they keep it it's more lasting you know it's more lasting I mean they, they hear the Hare Krishna mantra and then you know they get distracted by this that and the other thing and they okay some some benefit was there but if they have the book they can, you know, constantly, repeatedly refer to it, refer back to it. They read something and then they read, read a bit more and they read a bit more. And it's, it's really like, it's what Prabhupada thought was the best program for, um, you know, people, for people in general to become Krishna conscious. Or oh, one of the best programs. <laughs> Certainly an important, very important program. I mean, right here in Los Angeles, you know, Prabhupada made various statements. He said, uh, Print as many books in as many languages as possible and distribute, and this Krishna conscious movement automatically spread. I mean, he said that. And then on another occasion he said, distribute book, distribute book, distribute book. So that's there. So that's very important, and we should remind ourselves of that. Um, just so nobody feels, I don't want to make anybody feel like, you know, well, he's a book distributor, and he's, now he's talking about his service. You know, it's... I apologize. Don't feel like that. I'm not. I'm not coming from that place. <laughs> it's it's something we could all do, especially here in Los Angeles, because this temple is organized in such a way that we don't have uh, our temple president is organized things in such a way that we don't. We're not in anxiety about the Lakshmi. We're not in anxiety about money. 
So really, anybody who wants to distribute books can distribute books. You know, you can, distrib you, you can distribute small books and even if you don't get a donation, so what? We're not worried about it, see? So basically, it makes it so much easier. So anybody who wants to distribute books can distribute books and it's a, it's a good idea. I know, I know so many different devotees who they take books with them, they have them in their purse or their suitcase or, and, and they just, Chandra Sheikh always tell me a story about how he, when he got to the airport, he saw some young lady standing waiting for her lift and he gave her Bhagavad Gita. So it's a good thing to do, just have some small books with you or even on chantings or something like that. And you can just give, you don't have to worry about, if, as soon as the money is out of the picture, for a lot of devotees, who especially who are not experienced Sankatan devotees, it's a big relief. You know, you don't have to feel an anxiety. It's just a question of just, you know, overcoming a little bit of self-consciousness possibly and approaching a, a stranger. But anyway, the opportunity is there. And it's, uh, it's a good way to start the ball rolling in terms of preaching. It's just giving people some piece of literature, you can give it to them for free. And, uh, you know, you'd be surprised. I mean, yeah, sure, there are going to be people who are going to not be interested, but there are going to be a lot of people who will be interested and, and you'll be able to, and it'll be an opportunity for you to preach further in a, on a lot of occasions. So that's there. Anyway, so basically the point I was making that, um, yeah, so, you know, we're fulfilling all of Rupa, the, the uh, criterion of Rupa Goswami's first instruction in, in uh, Upadesha Amrita by just engaging in the, the activities that uh, Prabhupada has given us, you know, as part of temple life. And, um, and one other point, and this is the same point actually, but I'm just going to try to fortify. Everybody knows the word supersede. Supersede means if somebody, like say somebody, something supersedes something, it means it surpasses the authority of the previous thing. See? So this is like a, a law has been passed and that supersedes the authority of this other. So, but nothing supersedes. This, this, this is how I think anyway. There's nothing that supersedes the authority of the order of the spiritual master. This, and so therefore, practically speaking, what that means in my mind, there's nothing that supersedes the program that Prabhupada's given us. This, this, there's nothing that supersedes, get, if you can, if you're physically able, if you're healthy enough to do it, getting up before four in the morning, you know, bathing, putting on clean clothes, coming to Mangalardi, chanting japa, worshiping Tulsi, chanting japa in the temple room, ideally, attending Guru Puja, attending Griya the deities, attending the, Bhag uh, you know, the Guru Puja, attending the Bhagavatam class, uh, and taking Bhagavad Prashanam and then doing your service. There's nothing that supersedes that. There's nothing that w is more important or will ever become more important than exactly that. You know, by doing exactly those things, which are of you know, paramount importance, you know, it's just coming right down from Prabhupada. It's, it's, you, could t you could take it as coming from all, just right down to the Zippic succession. By doing that, we're, you know, doing the, 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 the best possible thing we could do to help us advance in spiritual life and, and become qualified to become leaders, as is being talked about in this verse. Instruments. Being a leader means, ultimately means being an instrument for the, uh, you know, the spiritual master and the predecessor acharyas. So, and so by following this program, you will become sarvamapimam pritivim sashashat. You become qualified to make disciples all over the world. In other words, you will become empowered to inspire people in Krishna consciousness. You will become empowered to act as a confirm. You'll be seeing it. Prabhupada starts chanting, that's confirmed. You'll become empowered to act as in the capacity of a Vartma Padakshana guru, a shiksha guru, a diksha guru, like that. You know, in, in, all those, in all cases, you're bringing people closer to Krishna. You're bringing people into Krishna consciousness, which is exactly what we want to do. And all you have to do to do that is take the whole thing, just take the basic thing seriously, you know? And, uh, and I, you know, please, I, I don't mean to be, if I'm sounding like I'm saying, yeah, I'm doing this, I'm, I'm preaching to myself here too, because we have to constantly remind ourselves about this, you know? But like, for instance, I'll give you an example of what I'm talking about. In the uh, Anchalila, um, chapter three, <clears throat> in that chapter about the glories of Haridas Thakur, there's uh, that you know in that one section is um, is a verse where it talks about how Haridas Thakur he sat down on the banks of the Ganges River, planted a Tulsi plant, and I don't even can't remember he put up a I don't even think he even built a little cottage. I think he just had the, his sitting place and, and a Tulsi plant, and he would chant, and it's describing in the purport how he chanted. Uh, 
300,000. He chanted day and night, he chanted 300,000 names daily. So Prabhupada says in the second paragraph of the purport that nobody could, um, that chanting is for Mukta Purush, an eternally liberated soul. But he says, but, so we can't imitate Hari Das Thakur. He said, but we can follow in his footsteps. And Prabhupada, he outlines, he says specifically how you do that. He said, chanting 16 rounds is not, does not take much time, nor is worshiping the Tulsi plant difficult. But simply by doing this, one can become spiritually strong. He says, therefore, we request the members of the Krishna Consciousness Movement to follow Haridas Thakur's example very rigidly by doing those things. He said, the process has immense spiritual potency. One should not miss this opportunity. See? So, I don't know. It's pretty clear. It's pretty, it's pretty, in other words, Papa is saying that, hey, do this. It's going to really help you in your spiritual life. And um, so... There's a, you know, there's, but there's a t always a tendency to just like, you know, oh yeah, yeah, if you don't get like a, a great result the first day or something like that, you, you have to just, we have to remind ourselves, no, yeah, this is like, you know, Bhakti Siddhanta <clears throat> Saraswati, he's famous for having said, in the morning you have to beat your mind with a shoe a hundred times, and then in the evening with a broomstick. So what does that mean? It doesn't mean that you literally take a shoe and hit yourself in the head a hundred times in the morning or take a broomstick. No. It means that you kind of constantly remind yourself of the instruction of the spiritual master. You know, because the mind's always going to kind of try to weasel out, wiggle out and weasel out of following strictly. See? So you've got to remind yourself, no, hey, I, I want to, it's, it's hot in here. The air is stale. I want to go outside and chant. Or I want to take a nap so I can, now, so I can be, have, be fresh. No, no. You, that's beating the mind with the shoe and beating the mind with the broomstick means just using your intelligence and telling your mind, no. Prabhupada said, chant here. Chant here in the temple room. Chant with Tulsi. You know, this is what's going to be the most beneficial. See, confirmed again. This is what's going to be the most beneficial. So that's, that's what's meant by beating the mind with the broomstick and beating the mind with the shoe. Using your intelligence, you know, reminding yourself of the instructions of the spiritual master and then just doing it. You know, making yourself do it and um, yeah and it works <laughs> it works uh, okay I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you something this is getting a little personal but I want to share this with you because okay so you know uh, I had a difficult last five years Okay, I, d I did something about five years ago, which wasn't very smart, and I, you know, kind of, it's due to karma, uh, I got an expression I got from it, I took a hit in my life, and I really was struggling in a lot of different ways, and, um, but I just, I've hung, you know, just, I, I kept hung in there, and tried to, you know, stick to engaging in devotional service as best I could, and, um, you know, just, doing the basic things, and, and just after I'm feeling some light at the end of the tunnel, like just recently I've had the good fortune of going out on Sankatan with Sachit and Oi Prabhu, and prior to that with Ananda Kirtan and uh, Deva Vrata, and by their nice spiritual association, I've become um, enthusiastic again in my what's really my service, which is book distribution. So... I'm having, basically, as I said, I'm having a good result. It works. When you, when you actually apply yourself to the process, it doesn't happen like instantaneously. This is not like just, you know, Krishna consciousness is not like one of these foods, fast food you see, which is just add water. It's not like that. It's not, instant, it's not instantaneous. You got to work at it. You got to work at it. But when you do work at it, um, at least my experience has been, I'm, I feel like I'm getting some positive result. You know, the process does work. The process does work, but we got to work at it to make it work. So anyway, I don't want to, I already kind of, time is up. So I, I could elaborate on that story, but just because I don't think, want to take advantage of the fact that it's already, my time is up. So I'll, I'll stop there. Does anybody have any questions or comments? Anything they'd like to throw in there? Uh, Jandra Shekhar, yeah. Thank you, Prabhu. Um, this is a question about theory versus practical reality regarding sense control. Um, putting aside the daunting statistics that many, you know, for example, many Prabhupada disciples have given up the process of Krishna consciousness altogether, a huge number, 
putting that daunting statistic aside, we ourselves have experienced and we've seen other devotees experience that in spite of engaging our senses in Krishna's service, right, in spite of doing hours of kirtan a day or doing tons of book distribution every day or tons of deity worship every day, in spite of really engaging our senses, not like you say restraining them, which is not our process, but engaging Rishikesha, Rishikena, we still see that devotees have difficulties with lust and not controlling the senses. So what, what is to be said about, about our condition? And okay. Everybody heard the question? Okay, I'm going to give an answer because I, I think I got, and I'm going to once again, I'm going to use myself as an example. As I mentioned to you, I went through this rough period, and I was, I kind of gave up my service. I stopped doing book distribution in a serious way because of what happened. My mind was so disturbed; it became very difficult. And I made the wrong decision of, rather than tolerating the, dis the disturbance in my mind and just pushing on with my service, I decided I need to kind of, you know, kind of back off from it and uh, do some other things which, so my mind wouldn't be do so disturbed and like that. But I experienced exactly what you were saying. I was, do I was going out in the Harinams. I was you know, doing a lot of other things, st but not enlivened. You know, the, the st I was still struggling with that problem and with other things as well. But just recently I got back into my, as I said, due to the good association of a few different people, I got back into my service and, uh, and that it's, now I'm feeling enlivened. I'm, you know, I mean, this last few weeks, even just going out with such and I, my, my book distribution has kind of gone, shh, and I'm feeling a lot less influence. Uh, not well, I won't say absolutely not at all, but significant improvement in my consciousness. So my answer to your question is this: that you can't mess up, you can't fool Krishna. Everybody's got a certain capacity. Everybody, you don't, if you don't think you're going to be able to give Krishna the minimum and get the maximum, it doesn't work like that. Krishna knows what you're capable of. Krishna knows what, Krishna, we know what the program is. We know what Krishna wants. He wants everybody to, you know, to really try as hard as they can to become a pure devotee and, and, and help other people become devotees as well. That's what Krishna wants. And Krishna knows what you're capable of. You, you, he knows what each one of us is capable of. And Krishna wants to see that we're really trying genuinely, sincerely to do to our best ability what we know he wants us to do. And when you do that, you feel satisfied. And when you don't do that, despite the fact that you, you, know, you might be doing the basic minimum stuff, what's required of you, but you won't feel satisfied. Because Krishna wants more. He wants more. So my answer to your question is if you, feel, if you feel like you're already surrendering but still you're struggling, I would just say surrender more. Don't doubt the process. Don't think, well, this, uh, this, uh, you know, I'm already surrendering and that means but I'm not experiencing what I want to be experiencing. So that means this process might, doesn't work or this philosophy might not be true. No. Find the fault with yourself. No, I've got to surrender more. I've got to take shelter of the philosophy more. I've got to try harder and then it'll work. And... Um, I'm having that experience, to, as I said, an in, insignificant, ex, you know, I mean, one insignificant example, but I feel like, and that, that's how I'm thinking. I'm trying to think along those lines, and, I've, and I'm feeling encouraged. You've got to try harder. Uh, Maharaj. Uh, thank you very much for a very insightful class. It's uh, very wonderful to hear many of the principles and concepts that you have been uh, mentioning throughout. There were a few ideas that had come to me. <clears throat> I'll try to put them in the most uh, essential or s smallest form possible. First of all, all of these, <clears throat> uh, not just ideas, but practices that you had mentioned, such as uh, getting up at 4 o'clock in the morning, taking a cool shower, or just even taking a shower at that time, getting to Mangal Artik, uh, and getting involved in the, in the practices, <clears throat> singing in Mangal Artik, doing 16 rounds a day. Uh, these are all very well and good, but uh, people are listening to this, and many of these people can't even come near those, that
<laughs> Keep going. Keep going. Thank you. Well, yeah, yeah. Th thank you. That's very good. I really like that. I really uh, appreciate the comment, and uh, you really, you know, f gave the rest of the the rest of the picture. And uh, when something like that happens, I don't feel I don't feel like uh, like put. I don't feel like I'm being criticized. You know, like uh, oh, you know, I I failed as a speaker because I didn't make those points. You can't make every point. I mean, maybe if, if you're power part of Shulaviyasadev, you can make every. But I feel if I, if I'm able to speak in such a way that other devotees become inspired to say something, to fill out what I'm saying, I feel good about that. So I thank you. I really appreciate that comment. I think that added a lot to the overall understanding of the class. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. Such a noipu. Who needs this mic? Thank you, Maharaj, for your great comment. I also have a comment, Prabhuda, in regards to the question that Chandra Sekhar asked. And I was seeing it in a little bit slightly different, maybe, in a way, in another angle. And in the Chaitanya Charitamrita, there are five items for successful achieving Krishna Prema or love of God. The association of devotees, you know, Sadhu Sangha, uh, chanting the holy names, Srimad Bhagavatam, and Mathura, the place where you reside. So, but we emphasize the association of devotees a lot. 
So then, why somebody might leave, there are many reasons. But also, I, I, in another place, it is mentioned that 50% can be said that we take responsibility or accountable for someone leaving too, and the other 50% be the, the person who leaves. In other words, we carry a, a, a great responsibility. Since we're right now, the verse that you're speaking Did you ever is about that? truthfulness. Did, did you ever hear Prabhupada say that directly or see it in writing? Uh, I mean, that, that one is... Uh, it, in, uh, it's like ISKCON folklore, isn't it? I mean, I've, I've heard that since the day I joined, practically speaking, but uh -huh. I can't ever remember reading it or hearing Prabhupada say it directly. It, exactly, but it is, it is there okay, somewhere. It's there. So then uh, that brings us to the point that each one of us has a great responsibility to actually make sure that those who join experience the qualities that have been displayed in the, that you just mentioned in the books. So that will be more attractive than the philosophical points and the rituals that we do. So if we actually come up with the, those qualities, then people will be very much attracted. And, you know, they may be experience happiness being in a in, in, in place wherever they join. So I just wanted to mention maybe that yeah. part that is the responsibility of each one of us as devotees and for those who have been here for a long time. And not necessarily just that person who unfortunately couldn't make it, but actually it might be my fault that I, when I had encountered with such person that I didn't give them, you know, that what he needed, you know, that inspiration, uh, maybe by my behavior, the way I was conducting myself. I, yeah. I'd you like got the point, right? Sorry. I want to make one last point, and I promise this will be it, and we'll stop. You know, in the ninth chapter, the 10th chapter of the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna says, Mach chita mat gita pana, budayantas parashpanam, gitayantas chamam nicham, tushanti charamantacham, that the thoughts of my pure devotees dwell in me, their lives are surrendered unto me, and they derive great satisfaction and bliss enlightening one another and conversing about me. So that's what we're doing here. This is a very important thing that we, I, I honestly, I, not to criticize, but we don't do enough of it here in New Dwarka, discussing the philosophy, you know, in an intelligent way, Krishna, according to Krishna, it gives it, you know devotees derive great satisfaction and bliss by doing this, enlightening one another, sharing their realizations and conversing. Some devotees, you know, leave time at the end of the class for questions and answers. Other devotees, for some of these, don't like to do that. We had a bad experience here in New Dwarka back about 24 years ago. We used to have istagostis, and then what happened was at the end of an istagosti, once somebody, you know, kind of uh, was very disruptive, and it was a, it had a whole scene. And Svavas became, he didn't want to do it anymore because he didn't want to have that happen. And it re really ruined it for, you know, for a lot of devotees for many, many years. But this is important. Um, it's a very important thing to do for devotees to come together. And here, of course, you know, somebody should give a class, yeah, but to discuss. And, you know, like Amla Bhaktanaj brings up a point. You bring up a point. I think it's very important. And you, you actually experience the people you're living with in a different way when you actually have the opportunity to hear them speak and hear their realizations and like that. So I don't know. I don't have any practical suggestions as to how we can implement something like that, but I just did want to say that I think this is a super important thing to have, give the opportunity for the devotees to share their realizations. Okay, thank you very much. Gontrad Srimad Bhagavatam Ki Jai. Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai. Krishna was born in California, here, the back to God, when that flower was, was, was in Guru Puja right now, yesterday. You can answer, he will answer you. 